Welcome uh, everybody to this uh, opening of uh, the Future uh, Week. Um, my name is Christian Bruere and um, I'm so happy to invite you all, both here in the audience and also you back uh, in front of the screens streaming this session. The first session of more than 50 sessions that is taking place during Future Week. In, and uh, we are based in three locations. It's happening in Oslo, it's happening in Stavanger, and also here at Bergen. Um, I would also like to say that uh, this uh, session, that it's uh, about 5G and the wireless revolution we are entering, and uh, that is uh, organized by the Nordic 5G Consortium. And uh, it's a cluster of Nordic media companies that is working together to, yeah, Developing the next generation services, it's a meeting place, it's an arena for exchanging both ideas, challenges and what kind of ways we have to work together to exploit the 5G technologies. Um, the work at the consortium has been taking place for a year now and our purpose is to be an arena to exchange, as I said. Uh, myself has just had a couple of weeks uh, into this uh, consortium and uh, I've agreed to participate as a, as a coordinator or project manager for this. So I'm looking forward to hear more from you who are here or those who are taking contact with us at the consortium. Um, the members' needs in the consortium is of course one of the things that is important for us and building meeting places like this is one of those kind of needs. Um, and uh, the network meetings are important and today we will network quite well. We will bring together both research, those who are using the services, the broadcasters, and we uh, will also speak with the regulators here locally in Norway. Uh, though we are a Nordic consortium, it's uh, quite interesting what's taking place today. Um, and uh, first, uh, I would like to introduce uh, those who are going to be speakers. We will meet them uh, in, in, a, in an order. And uh, before I reveal the first one, we would like to welcome NRK, that is one of the founders of the 5G Consortium. And um, NRK had their first multi-camera production done in a private 5G network last week. And we are thrilled to hear more about that. And we will also hear from uh, Budel Molsgred, who is the head of technology here at the NRK West, uh, about the strategies uh, they are seeking. Erik Woll, who is uh, the project manager for the test last week and also an engineer, will speak more about that. We will, uh, f before NRK, we will meet Sintef and Bård Myhre. Uh, the research organization uh, who is uh, bringing a lot of knowledge into this uh, consortium, uh, not the consortium, the 5G technology. But before we dig into those two sessions, we would like to welcome uh, ANCOM, which is the short thing for the Norwegian Communication Authority, and Aspen Slatta. And he sits at the spectrum department there. Um, and um, Mr. Slatte, he's not present here, and there's a reason why. And uh, he is uh, now uh, uh, popping up on screen, as you see behind me. Um, he can only participate via link, and that's a special reason, because uh, there's a small announcement or a small news today in this space, and that is a new auction for 5G licenses in Norway taking place today. It's opening in yeah, less than a half an hour. So uh, welcome, uh, Mr. Slatte. Um, as I said, today, 9 a.m., is that correct? Is that when we you yes, are it, opening up the auction? Yeah. 9.30 a.m. it will start. Yeah, yeah. Nine, yeah, yeah. okay, 9.30, okay, so it's, we have more than an hour. So it's just to find a... It, it's a little bit too late to start auctioning if you haven't signed up, isn't that correct? Yes, that's correct. <laughs> you had to sign up a few weeks ago if you wanted to participate and also put... Um, a few million in the back as well in order to be able to participate. So it's uh, it's not for everyone to participate now. Now that's that's for sure, and uh, that's what exactly what we're going to speak a little bit about. Um, and uh, what is taking place? This the you, you can elaborate a little bit more about that. But that is the 
it's, it's two frequencies uh, spectrum areas that is opening up. It's 2.6 gigahertz and the 3.6 for those who would like to have the details there. Um, can you tell us a little about uh, what's uh, taking place now? Yes, I can. So uh, as you said, it's the 2.6 gigahertz band and the 3.6 gigahertz band that is up for auction. Uh, those two bands are very important frequency bands for both 4G and 5G. So we don't di dictate what technology the operators are going to use, but these bands are uh, mainly used for mobile production, namely 4G and 5G. Uh, so, um, so, so we are kind of pragmatic to what they're going to use them for, um, but the most likely technology, as I said, is, is 4G in the 2.6 gigahertz band, at least short term, and 5G in the 3.6 gigahertz band. And an auction, uh, if you're not too familiar about that, it's basically like any other so-called Dutch auction. It's like buying a house. Um, except that now we're selling several objects, so several houses at the same time. Um, so you, you start buying. We, we set a surprise uh, that you need to, to kind of pay before you can enter. And then the bidders just start bidding and, and say how much they're willing to pay for, for each house to, to use that analogy. And as long as the demand is higher than the supply, the prices will continue to increase uh, and the auction will continue. Uh, and to make sure that no one is able to buy all the houses or all the frequency blocks, we, we set a cap on how much uh, each operator can buy in order to have more winners to say in, in that sense. And, and that is basically for to, to keep the competition in the market. We don't really want the, uh, uh, the operator with the biggest pockets to buy everything and to kind of hinder competition in the mobile market. So there is a cap, uh, and, and the cap would allow at least three winners in the 2.6 gigahertz band and four winners in the 3.6 gigahertz band. And it's the 3.6 gigahertz band that's basically the most important band for 5G in the short term. <clears throat> that's kind of the band that will provide uh, the, the really high throughput that we see from 5G tests around the world. Yeah. Can you tell us a little about who's participating? Because as you said, you had to sign up in, in advance. Do we see media companies or can you reveal something about how many they are? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, unfortunately not. The, we are very strict on, uh, on, on the information that we provide to external. Uh, basically, there's only just a few people within Encom itself that actually knows who participates. Uh, and, and there is a good reason for that, because uh, there is a lot of money involved. Um, just just the initial bids, if all the, the frequency blocks are, if there's a bid on all the initial frequency blocks, the, the first round will, will set for 1.4 billion Norwegian kroners. So, so there needs to be a tight, uh, ski, a tight regulation on who knows what, even within Encom. So we don't uh, reveal how many or who will participate in the auction. We only reveal the winners after the auction. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we had to ask about that. So, and it's also important to say that uh, there was a hearing in, in advance of, of this auction, as it very often is. And, and you saw that media companies like NRK and TV2, they had their comments on that. Um, and, uh, but you decided that, yeah, that all these frequencies, they should be nationwide. They were going uh, and uh, not local or, or for private networks set, setting up. Um, we will hear more about setting up private networks inside the 5G. And, um, and uh, the reason why I'm asking this is that both the media industry and other industries, they have highlighted the wish for private networks inside the 5G um, um, arena. But if you, can, if you can say a little bit about if this is nationwide, then you will most likely end up with operators offering this to, 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 per, to, yeah, to the commercial market. There will, no, there will most likely be no, no private networks inside here. But uh, can you tell us a little bit about those kind of uh, meet that kind of demand that you, that you had from the broadcaster, for instance? Yes, uh, a lot of questions. I'll try to try yeah. to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yes, the uh, the the main objective of this auction is to provide frequencies for the mobile operators, and I shouldn't. That's that's kind of the fact. 
it's it's to provide 5G services to the Norwegian population. That that has been the objective for the the government, and and that's what we're delivering. Uh, that said, uh, there's also been a kind of sub objective as well, and that's provide uh, possibilities for the industry to innovate as well. So so there is an option uh, to get frequencies within the 3.6 gigahertz band for private networks. But the regulation is set forth for the industry, uh, basically the, the traditional industry uh, in, 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 um, in defined areas in Norway. So, so there is kind of a twofold kind of setup for this auction. The, the auction itself is, is focused around uh, the traditional mobile operators, to use that word, but they have an obligation uh, to provide uh, services also to industries in, in defined areas where they're not going to roll out networks themselves. Yeah. Uh, the media industry was uh, vocal in the public consultations, as you said. Uh, unfortunately, they came a little bit late to the table, but uh, we have heard them. And we are going to discuss further with the media production companies going forward. And that's very important for us because we want to understand and we want to provide solutions to them as well. But this band uh, particularly was not for the media uh, production companies or media industry. That's what, that's, what, that's what not the objection of this auction, unfortunately. Oh, well, thanks for that. And um, what about future spectrums? Would that be more relevant for them? Or do you see it? Uh, or would you bring in more like uh, yeah, demands, or you can call it that, uh, for the operators to, to, to work together with, for instance, media and other industries? That's a, that's a great question. And, and, and we need to understand more the needs of the media industry. That's for sure. Uh, we have heard some through the public consultation. We want to learn more, talk closer with the media industry. So after the auction, we will uh, reach out to the media industry in Norway and, and, and start to discuss with them what their needs are and how to solve them. So, so that's, that's, that's very important. Uh, and, and there is a lot of frequency bands that is and could be uh, important in that sense, uh, especially a frequency band that is uh, used a lot for 5G in other uh, countries, not European countries, because European regulation is quite strict and because we have European harmonization work kind of setting out the, um, the regulation in Europe. But there is a lot of bands used in other regions, and especially the 2.3 gigahertz band, which is used in Asia, uh, is a 5G band and is also a frequency band that is used by the media industry today. So that's used for uh, PMSE or media production kind of services. Um, and that's the band that will be awarded in the next few years. So, and, and that could be an interesting band, um, but it also needs to we need to understand the needs for the media industry because another important uh, issue for us is to have um, using the frequencies um, as good as possible. And if the media industry needs these frequencies just for a few hours, uh, sometimes a year, it's not very uh, good economics to, to provide them with a full frequency band that could be used for 5G production by others. So we need to find the right balance between the right users. Uh, so that's important. And that's why I, I stress the fact that we need to understand the needs of the media industry. Yes, uh, the, thank you. I think the uh, companies here are glad to, for that invite. And, uh, and I hope that a meeting like this can also yeah, be a starting point for that. Uh, we will have a small debate uh, later on uh, between uh, where we would at least have one of the media companies involved. And you have uh, agreed to follow us there, um, Aspen. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, so that we, we will find more, uh, more details there. Uh, one thing that you said about the the, the uh, relationship with the rest of Europe or a neighboring country, uh, since this is also a Nordic consortium. What can you say about what is, what is the most important things that you have to deal with to be, yeah, uh, be on a cross border that also this industry needs to know because they are also traveling? Yes. Uh, so, so cross border uh, is, is, of course, important and it's. It's easier if you have kind of the, the same services on each side of the border, because then it's easier to bring your equipment and your frequency planning uh, across borders. 
And especially in this band, the 3.6 gigahertz band, and with 5G as a service, it's even more important because, and I guess Sintef will talk more about this later, but um, 5G uh, promises a lot of uh, different use cases, but you can't get all of them at the same time because you need to take, uh, do some choices in advance to define how many so-called time slots you're going to use to send data from the base station and how many time slots you're going to send data up till the base station. And if you have a different scheme on that, on different side of the border, you, you easily get interference. And that's the same if you have different um, up and down scenarios within different regions in Norway as well. So if you wanted, for, like say, an, a heavy uplink service as the media industry might be, uh, close to a traditional mobile service, which has been usually a heavy downlink, then you, you get an interference scenario. And you need to do something then in order to make sure that you don't interfere with each other. And that is uh, that, that could be done in two ways, basically. You could take a, a geographical separation. So you need to define that in this area, you cannot use the same frequencies. Or you need to take frequency separation and say that you can't really use these frequencies in this area because you need some kind of separation. And neither of these two options are spectrum efficient. So, so that's why we need to find a different solution for different services in different areas, both geographically and frequency-wise. Okay. Um, a final question before we, we, we move on. Can you say something about uh, whether the technology de uh, the development here, is, is that going faster than the regulations or uh, or the needs are, are popping up faster than you can regulate? How, how is the balance between what's happening on, on this side now and what you have to regulate? That's a, that's a really great question. And, and technology, technology is going fast, really fast at the moment. And that's why, as I mentioned earlier as well, uh, the regulation as such is not service nor technology defined. So it's service and technology neutral. And the, the, the fact for that is because technology is going so fast because we don't really know what, te what technology is going to be used in the coming years. So, so that's, that's one thing that uh, mitigates the, um, the, the regulation being lacking behind. Uh, so, but, but, and if we are going to select the technology, uh, we would most likely miss uh, more than we would hit. So, so that's one of the mitigations that we do. Uh, the other thing that it's not the same, but it, it's kind of uh, in the same department, is that I think that the regulator as such um, sees quite far into the future and, and understands what the, the possibilities of new technology is, and, and especially with the 5G. But the problem, uh, I think, is that we were not uh, good enough to express the possibilities of 5G, and hence we were not able to interact with industry or media in an early enough phase. So when we started to setting forth the regulation, uh, we uh, provided and we asked operators and media and everyone to, to, to come to the table. But I think that we were not able to, to sell the story and tell the possibilities of 5G at that time. And hence we were not able to interact with the, the media industry three, four years ago when we started this process. So I think we have a lot to do, and, and this initiative is, is great in that sense. We need to, to, to just talk together and understand the different needs, and we need to be better to also uh, talk about the possibilities of new technology going forward. Thank you so much uh, for that kind of yeah, uh, open-minded approach. And uh, you, I, I think you served well to, over to the next speaker here. Uh, Bård Myra from Sintef, who is, is going to speak about the possibilities. Good luck with the auction, uh, and perhaps the first bid will come in so, while we're having this Thank meeting. <laughs> so, uh, Bård, uh, please uh, enter the stadium, uh, the scene. Uh, <laughs> and uh, as uh, you said, it's 5G is more than faster 4G. It is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and. Uh, uh, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, my name is Burg Myre. I'm a research scientist with uh, Sintef. We're, we're located mainly in Trondheim and in Oslo. Uh, and uh, as some of you may know, uh, Sintef is, is a technical 
Research Institute, meaning that we really like to dive into the technical details. Today, I will try to not dive that much into the details, but try to maintain a rather high-level perspective on 5G. But I can promise that there will be some abbreviations, even, I think, a five-letter abbreviation for those of you who really like to go into the details. But it shouldn't be necessary to understand anything of it. So what I, I will do is try to give you a brief overview of 5G, what it is, why it's more than four, just faster 4G, um, and hopefully sum up with some, um, some, uh, some concluding remarks, uh, providing some ideas forward. Okay, so uh, before um, starting with anything, we should probably uh, just go through the main components of a mobile network. Uh, and obviously, a mobile network is immensely complex. Uh, but they have three main components. So we could start with the user equipment, which is typically a cell phone. Or previously it was typically a cell phone, now it's typically, typically a device. It could be a, an iPad, tablet, it could be a watch, it could be anything. But traditionally it's a cell phone, and this is what we call user equipment, or what the mobile community calls a user equipment. Then we have a base station, or actually several base stations, and these base stations, they cover the country, uh, and all the country, and together these base stations form what the technical community calls a radio access network, or RAN for short. Um, this spans the entire country, or almost the entire world, uh, and I think that um, in Norway, there are between 15 or 20,000 of these, uh, these, uh, these uh, base stations. Do I have, yeah, might be some technical trouble. Testing, testing. There we are. Okay, so this, this is the radio access network. And uh, we just represent that by, by one of these base stations. But you know then that there are enormous amounts of base stations around the country. Finally, we have the core network, which controls all the base stations, controls all the information, and also handles network management, subscriptions, billing. So this is where all our um, subscription information is located, and when I call some of you, I would go call with my cell phone, going through the base stations, to the core network, and back. So it's, we actually use all the network uh, whenever we make a phone call. Okay, so this is the basic components. And just a brief look on how this actually works in Norway today. So this is the national infrastructure the radio access network, and the core network. And uh, these are deployed by the mobile operator, or mobile network operators, which in Norway are ICE, Tela, and Telenor. These operators, they provide national coverage, as we know, and they provide interoperability. Uh, but what they don't provide is the technical components. So what they have done is to procure solutions and technology from Ericsson, Huawei, and Nokia, for instance. So these three are the, uh, the, the main providers of technical components within the mobile network. And knowing that, we know that this is where the technology development goes. And on the other hand, the telecom operators or mobile network operators provide services to the country and to the users. And with that, we know everything we need to know to go really into what 5G is. So, okay, what's new in 5G? And then I'll first start with a thing, a thing that is actually not new, or what we, from a research perspective, consider as not that new, and that is the faster 4G. So 5G will obviously provide higher data rates for more users compared to 4G. But that's not really new. That is exactly what 4D, 4D did to 3G as well. Uh, but what we could look at is that the user equipment then is 
uh, improved and the radio access network or base station is improved with something called enhanced mobile broadband. And this is not for you to really see. It's a, an abbreviation down here. But this one is improved so that we can now actually uh, have even faster 4G within uh, the concept of 5G. Um, Esben Schlette from Encom told about the, the um, uh, frame structure of 4G uh, and 5G, and mainly 5G. And this frame structure is optimized for downlink, sending information from the radio access networks to the user equipment. This is a challenge when you provide or produce information here that should be, um, that should be uh, sent into the network. And this is a challenge that can be handled by using um, private networks and or, oops, yeah, I think there might be a change there, but yeah. Yeah, just continuing. Uh, so that means that uh, this one could be configured differently in different applications, providing different data rates in either direction. Okay, so this wasn't actually quite new. What is new is the support of Internet of Things. So 5G now supports what we could call a large amount of wireless sensors with long battery lifetime and communication range. And this means that this user equipment, which traditionally was a mobile phone, uh, could now be a, an IoT or Internet of Things sensor. This means that this could send information from all over the place. Uh, in one project, we are uh, monitoring, um, we're monitoring uh, uh, landslide parameters, uh, soil moisture, for instance, uh, to see if, uh, if there is increased risk of landslide using such type of IoT sensors. This is also means that 5G has provided a new type of link called Massive machine type communication. Okay, thank you. Let's see. There we are. Okay, yeah. Uh, so that means this one is another type of feature for 5G called massive, massive machine type communication. And that type of communication is distinctively different from the enhanced mobile broadband because this does not support high data rates. It supports large number of devices. Okay, so for the third new thing with, um, with uh, 5G, uh, 5G also offers another type of communication, a third type of communication, which we have called industrial communication, uh, but technically it's, it's not only for uh, industrial, it's that 5G also offers wireless communication with what is called high reliability and low latency, meaning that you really can know that the information is coming through, and you know that it will be with uh, low latency. It will not support the highest data rates, though, uh, but in some applications, this is what is needed. And for instance, if we uh, have a look at this old figure again, we now replace the user equipment with a mobile robot, which should perhaps be configured really fast and controlled, and in that case, we introduce the five-letter acronym URLLC, uh, which you probably shouldn't try to remember, but it stands for Ultra Reliable Low Latency Communication. So these are the three types of communication that are provided by 5G. Okay, so with, with these three types of communication, you can also add, you can combine them, uh, or actually you can't combine them, but you could use one of them. And for each one of them, you could add what is called quality of service. And with 5G, you can guarantee a certain quality of service through segregation of different applications. And in practice, that means that if you have a mobile robot, which should be really, it's really important for you. And then you have some user equipment, or perhaps you don't have user equipment, but you are very in the close vicinity to other people having lots of user equipment. You have a mobile robot, for instance, near uh, a stadium with uh, thousands of people. Then the mobile robot could potentially face a challenge because this link could be jammed. And 
as you don't want that to happen, uh, you would probably want to do something with the core network and radio access network so that this one can be prioritized. And that is what is called network slicing. And I guess you have to have good eyes to see that network slicing is written here. Uh, but network slicing is, means that you segregate a part of this, these services and direct those towards the mobile robot or any other service. Uh, and this means that you are able to know what capacity the mobile robot will get, independent of how many users are uh, texting or snapping from their um, cell phones. OK, call to service. So one final thing. There are lots of new things in 5G, but we'll uh, settle for these five uh, to start with. So final thing, that, or a technical thing that I'll uh, talk about is data management. 5G uh, introduces what we call local data routing to ensure low latency and also to provide improved security. And the reason for doing that is for providing time sensitive, uh, sensitive and critical production data. Um, and as you see, I'm a research scientist. We like these, these complex but, uh, but really concise uh, sentences. But I'll, I'll show you what that means. So we, we say once more hello to our mobile robot, which is connected to the radio access network and the core network. And I think I have a sound in the monitor here. Yeah. Um, OK, so now we have a control room which wants to control the mobile robot. And they want to control that with a low latency, because it really needs to be controlled fast. And, um, and, and if it doesn't work, uh, it would really be a problem for you. Uh, there, we introduce what is called uh, local data routing, uh, or age communication, meaning that the control room and mobile robot can communicate directly without going through the entire chain into the core network and back which is what is the standard today. Um, and that means that with 5G, you can actually survive, or your network could actually operate, technically at least, uh, even though you have some problems on the right side, because communication could, if you have configured the network correctly, could go just through the base station and back to another unit in the system. OK. So these are the, or not the, these are five of the novelties of 5G. So um, from a technical perspective, this could be enough. But uh, we also ha have another thing, and that is called private 5G networks. And private 5G networks is how to use all these things um, within the context of private frequencies, which uh, Encom um, slightly touched upon. Um, and which I will go a bit more into because that is one of the important things that is provided or uh, made possible with 5G. Okay, so private 5G networks. And to understand that, we need to know what private 5G, what, what is not private 5G networks. So uh, let's start out with a new fact that 5G frequencies can be allocated to private actors for local use in geographically limited areas. Uh, another of those uh, very, very pedagogical uh, sentences. But I'll, I'll, I'll show you what that means. It means that ICE, Tele and Telenor have licenses, and there is an auction, auction today for such licenses covering the entire country. And when they buy these, or win these auctions, or win these slots, or frequency ranges, uh, they will have the license to, uh, to, uh, to um, establish a network throughout the country. On the other side, with 5G, or not technically with 5G, but, but simultaneously with 5G, uh, any company or organization may now uh, also uh, get frequencies for local use. Uh, within a small, small area of Norway. And examples of that could be an uh, industrial facility, a factory, 
It could be this is probably a, this is a hospital bed, so it could be within hospitals. Uh, it could be within this is a, yeah a construction sites. Uh, it could be within public houses, uh, schools, universities, and media production, for instance. So any of these and many more could establish private 5G networks um, on local areas. Okay, so just to give you an idea of what a private 5G network could be and why it could be of use. Uh, so even though this is a media conference, my, my background is from industry. So I'll, I'll pick an, an example from the industry. Hopefully there are some, um, let's say, some, some similarities, but at least this is what I know. Uh, so it shouldn't be too wrong instead of me trying to figure out a case uh, within media. So this is a box. Or actually, uh, it's a production facility. It's a factory. And that factory traditionally has a couple of robots. And these robots are controlled by a control room. In the traditional way, there are static robots, permanent, and they are uh, connected uh, with uh, wires. Traditional, good, rock solid. Then uh, an ambition, ambitious person decides that we should need a mobile robot. And that mobile robot is to move around and is also to be controlled by the control room. But you don't like wires, because wires is not very good with mobile robots. And that means you have to use something else. And uh, since this is a 5G um, conference or a, a 5G session, uh, then what we think we do is to go to ICE, Tele and Telenor, and ask well, how do we connect this robot to, uh, to the rest of the world? Or how could we connect to this robot? And then the mobile network operators, or the telecom operators, would say that we have a radio access network. It covers your facility. We have a core network, which handles all these base stations. And we will be very happy to provide you with wireless connectivity, or wireless network. And that also means that if you connect to the core network through internet, your control room will be able to control the mobile robot through the mobile network. Perfect. Um, and this is what's called the public network solution. OK, so this is, this is what you could actually get today. Uh, what we'll now look into is why this not necessarily isn't a perfect solution and what we could do with that. So first, I'll just remove the telecom operators. They will still be with us, but I think it's, uh, it's not that important to focus on them. But this, these are still owned by the telecom operators. OK, so public network. Away with that, and then we uh, see that we would like to improve this. Uh, for instance, that we would like to have guaranteed reliability for that link. And then we go back to the telecom operators. And what they do, if you remember now, they will provide you with a slice saying that, OK, we can guarantee, you, guarantee that you will have some uh, connectivity, even though they are, there are other operators in the area. And you might be happy with that, saying that, OK, this is what's called a non-public network using public infrastructure. Another not too optimal uh, concept, uh, but it actually means that we are using the public infrastructure, which is already there, to provide you with what you experience as a non-public or uh, more private-like network. So you feel that it's private, you feel that it's your network, but it's actually a part of the public infrastructure. OK, so say you are happy with that solution. Then you suddenly realize that you don't really like your control room to be connected to the internet in case someone hacks this. This doesn't look too good. So what you do next is saying, OK, this is, this is a bit of a problem for me. Uh, so I remove that, and I'm more happy with having a wireless link directly to the, to the network. Uh, still technically the same. It's using public infrastructure, and you experience it as a non-public network. And as we have seen, the information could go directly through the base station, so we don't have to go to main office. 
Okay, so still quite happy, but, but the next question is this one. What if something happens with this? It's located in a neighboring building, perhaps on the mountaintop. Um, would it be possible to move this into the production facility and setting it up within your, uh, your area and within your property? And by doing that, you get what we, we call a non-public network. It's still experienced as a non-public network. It's your network, but it's with RAN on-premise, with radio access network within your premises. And this means that you actually control this base station. It, it's not yours, because it's owned by the telecom operators, but it's, it's still uh, uh, within your property, and you can safeguard it, if you'd like. Okay, so, so still uh, even better. And you could also, for, uh, for instance, connect this one with a wire, if you'd like that, because that's, uh, that's even better sometimes. Uh, but let's stick to the, the wireless thing. Um, let's see. Next question up is, what about this link? Because you are not completely happy with having having someone working or uh, potentially interfering with the operation. So you, you ask the question, well, what, what about this this link? So next up is, what if we move a part of this core? into the production facility and establish a local core. Uh, and we connect that to the external core, or the actual national core, and we have what is called an isolated non-public network. And now, now, now this really gets interesting, or uh, perhaps complex, or uh, for some even uh, a bit too complex. But this, this, is, this has a nice feature, because if this link is broken, then this still works. Uh, but if it isn't broken, then it is there providing you, you with uh, network access. Okay, so this is the isolated non-public network. Um, and then if you have that situation, then you suddenly may ask yourself, what about these private networks using private frequencies that someone mentioned? Uh, could that be something for me? And now what we do is saying that this one, what if you own this? So now we switch from local core to private core. And we switch from radio access network to private run. And perhaps we also connect wire with wires or something, but that's not that important. Uh, but what we do is actually we do have a private network using private frequencies. And even more interesting is that now we can go directly to the, uh, to the equipment providers called Ericsson, Huawei, and Nokia, or perhaps others, and ask them to provide these services without going through the national networks or the companies providing national coverage. Okay, we could even, even actually call this just an access point, and then it's more like the original Wi-Fi that we already have. So, um, summing up, the motivation for this is that we provide, we get enhanced security and reliab reliability, we get no third-party involvement from the telecom operators, and we can configure these as we like. What we do need is access to 5G-enabled equipment, and also we need these licenses to use these private frequencies. Okay, so what does this mean? Very short, this means that 5G is much more than mobile communication. It's also local communication, it's in-house communication, it's industrial communication. 5G aims to be a unifying technology, meaning that it aims to unify use cases along different sectors. So it could be used within transportation, media, health, anything. And finally, 5G challenges the existing market positions, meaning that the telecom operators might do other things that they previously did. And what this all means is that probably 5G has a huge potential for value creation within new markets and within 
new ways of working between existing companies and new companies. And with that, I think I have concluded my presentation. Um, so I think I leave the floor back to you. So much, Bod. A little, a little applause there. Um, it's, uh, as you said, value creation. Th that is very much about. And uh, you spoke uh, widely about private networks. And that is exactly what we want to hear more about now. Because now we will look at how the private networks can work with yeah, and what, you, what we're calling a robust remote production. Um, NRK has uh, recently done tests. Uh, NRK has also yeah, pointed out their first strategies for how to use the 5G. Uh, please welcome uh, Bodel Molsgred. Uh, she's the head of technology at Regenvest. Uh, if you come up to the stage first, and, uh, and uh, she will be followed by her colleague Eric Wold. Uh, but first, some words from yeah. you, Bodel. Go ahead. Storytelling creates new technology, and new technology creates new storytelling. It's all about telling stories. And new technology can give us new opportunities. Uh, this video was a little collection of some highlights from more than 10 years with Slow TV. Uh, and these unusual projects are invented by an arcade seated here in Media City Bergen. Uh, most of them have had challenges to solve regarding how to get live signals in-house from all kinds of different places. But being able to solve that gave us a lot of new stories. Uh, close to people in small and bigger places around all the Norway. They didn't come to us, we came to them. So, how can we use 5G to tell stories? The first picture looks quite scenic at first sight, but in fact it shows a dramatic event, news event this year, only a few kilometers from here. Uh, it was a big fire threatening a whole community. Uh, of course, when the, this happens, we need quickly live streams. Uh, and we need a lot of photographs, video journalists, and people delivering content to different news desks, quick and efficient. 5G could perhaps help us to do that in future. The second picture is from a concert arranged by NRK. It could be a sport event or a press conference, uh, but it's a place, places where a lot of people are together using their mobile phones and network. Uh, today that could cause problems. But 5G can give better capacity uh, and secure a more stable delivering also from different locations with many people. And of course, 5G can make it easier to uh, make all kinds of unusual projects in future, like following Lars Monsen uh, at the last picture. Uh, we use IP equipment today. Like you see uh, at the left side, we use uh, Quantum or LiveView. Uh, they uh, use minimum two SIM cards uh, to aggregate network uh, and or wireless connection. Uh, this is equipment that 
don't every camera have. We don't have that equipment with every camera or every microphone today. It's also quite expensive. Uh, and we also see a change uh, where we have teams with cameramen, reporters going out to more video journalists to making stories of themselves. That requires less equipment and we also need equipment that are easy to operate. Uh, we also see that journalists now are more are going live by themselves. We call it solo live. Uh, that is possible to do because we have smaller cameras and the cameras deliver great pictures. Uh, and we have to do that more in future. Uh, this also uh, can make it easier for journalists to get closer to the stories. And that could also cause different stories. Uh, but today we still need the IP equipment. At the right picture you can see a microphone with an eSIM. Uh, this makes this use 5G. Uh, 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 we will still probably use IP bounding several SIM cards, but using eSIM will give us a lot more opportunities to get closer to the story and to get more content home in an easier way. Uh, although we have to remember that uh, anyway, what is the equipment? On these sides, we need communication and we need low la latency back in the field. That is important. But future is wireless. So what about OV vans? How can we have less equipment uh, at the locations doing bigger events? We are actually talking about what is between those two pictures. To the right is a concert with Aurora in Nidarosdomen. This concert was produced by an OB van uh, outside the church. A lot of people traveled by plane, uh, worked outside the church, stayed at hotels and traveled by plane home again. To the left we can see a control room. Uh, this is the con control room here in Anake, was uh, used to produce a lot of these uh, uh, slow TV productions, uh, but it also could be a control room another place. To do a remote production means that uh, a minimum of our staff is situated at the location uh, and we are using our control room instead of OB vans. Um, but we need some infrastructure between uh, uh, and that uh, today we can use fiber, in future maybe the infrastructure here is 5G. <clears throat> anyway, the workflow is different. Uh, to do remote production is not the same as using OBVANS. So anyway, we need to learn how to do the, the workflow. We need to train to, that, to do that. We need competence. Uh, and we have a lot of benefits to use a uh, traditional environment. Uh, that is like, uh, uh, of course, uh, the environment, environment and benefit is obvious and media companies also have to take that into account. But also, like working on well-known equipment in proper conditions, uh, we utilize our control rooms even more. Access to raw material and editing is also quite important stuff. So this workflow we also can use into news productions. But of course we will still have some OBVANs, but remote productions will grow. So hopefully we can see a future where we can make content and tell stories from almost anywhere. A future where we can connect to IP extern ex to we can connect without external IP equipment using eSIM and have microphones and cameras connected to radio studios or control rooms. A future where we can uh, do remote production almost wireless. A future where we can more work more efficient with our staff and equipment. Uh, this gives the same uh, opportunities to all companies. Uh, and we need to invest in future technology and build competence to meet the competition. 
and we need to do some proofs of concepts. And that you're going to tell us more about, Eric. Okay, so uh, we have to set hairy goals, I guess. Uh, I've been working uh, with an innovation product. It's actually called Innovation Days. So it's two days where we try to do something that is claimed to be impossible. And um, uh, what we are trying to do here is actually replacing fiber um, and trying to see if we could, we could make that work uh, as it does in remote production today. And why would you want to replace fiber in an outside broadcast? I mean, that's insane. Fiber has all the right qualities. It's great for capacity. It has very low error rate. It's great for low latency as well. So it delivers. The main reason is we want flexibility. Imagine if you were to uh, add another camera here in this scenario. It's not very easy to pull a fiber cable through that cr crowd or through any of the slopes. It's very difficult to change your plan, basically. And in many cases, we need to. So wireless is more flexible. And also, when you go into more compressed formats that's needed for wireless, you also get formats that are uh, possible to transport on internet. And uh, with IP comes uh, way more uh, efficient workflows. We're able to bring in all the content, uh, even single cameras, ISO feeds, into the cloud, uh, and you can work on the content coming in uh, instantaneously uh, from anywhere. So it's like a distributed production. So you can have many parallel workflows, many producers working on the same content at the same time. So that's basically the picture below. I think that's, that's very promising for the future, and it's definitely the way to go. So how do we do this? Well, we don't hire jets. That's not what we do. I just put it there. It's really cool for the picture. <laughs> so uh, what we do is, at first, we borrow equipment. We can't buy this now. But for the innovation days, I would say this was one of the more ambitious innovation days I've ever <laughs> orchestrated. Um, we were able to, to borrow uh, a cell on wheels, that is cow for short. It's basically uh, something that you can pull behind a car that will give you both, both uh, coverage and uh, high capacity on demand at an area that you need it. Um, in this case, we were at a parking lot in Elverum outside an army camp, so it wasn't very useful for production, but it was very nice to, to test it there, basically. And the, we, we did manage to pull a lot of resources to this uh, Norwegian defense guys with Telnor on the team. Uh, and it has been very valuable for us. The biggest thing I would say with this is not only it's uh, on-demand uh, coverage, but it's also way more capacity than what would be achievable in a public network. Because here you can play with the frame structure, as uh, Bourne mentioned previously in, in this presentation. So you can get higher uplink than downlink, or at least you will get higher uplink uh, than what's common in the public network. That's a value to us. Another thing that is, of course, interesting and very challenging <laughs> is the demand to get really low latency. Because when we produce on fiber, we are achieving low latency for video, um, basically because we can do it uncompressed or compression at uh, a very low rate, so we can compress single images. Uh, and we're easily able to go below 40 milliseconds. That is the ideal latency, I think, in this case and even below 20 milliseconds. So why would you want low latency? Um, well, it's uh, basically because you need a feedback in the viewfinder, so you get the program returns. So you can compare your, your still images, uh, sorry, your, your uh, planned images uh, to the actual program output. And more importantly, I think you need low latency uh, when you're controlling a camera. Because if the response is very slow when you're controlling a camera, you will get overcompensation or the catch-up effect, as someone might call it, and that doesn't work for us. But of course, 40 milliseconds, that, very, that is very demanding. Uh, we might need to live with something above 100, 120 milliseconds most likely, and then still you will be able to cover most of the events, not the more challenging ones where we have quick shifts, but man, many events we can still cover. Okay, so uh, in this case, uh, that's more challenging, audio requirements. Uh, this is the most challenging of all when it comes to latency. 
because here you will hear your own voice. It's in-air monitoring. And if I was to hear my voice uh, a bit delayed, I would be very confused and I wouldn't be able to do this presentation. So uh, this is something uh, we definitely need to work on. How do you realistically make four milliseconds lat latency on a mobile network? Well, the radio part will take one millisecond at least on each part. So that you're left with two milliseconds on the processing. And then you can't have processing deep into a cloud. The processing needs to be uh, very close to the uh, radio, the base station, the radio access network. And that is what they call edge computing, uh, mobile edge computing, MEC in 5G. And that is interesting to look into as well. So this is the, the team that we managed to pull together. Uh, we had the greatest guys from, uh, well, it's all guys, basically, <laughs> uh, from uh, network uh, and, of course, also production. And uh, we also uh, asked uh, Triple M to help us. That's an external company. But they have been looking into cloud-based infrastructure for a while, and it's nice to test that as well, just to see if we were able to get a more efficient workflow. And uh, it's all done in a parking lot, so not too interesting, I would say, but it's, it's still just to test equipment and see uh, basically what the gap is, how much uh, is remaining to make this work properly in a production. This is the antenna, and of course, that can cover a way bigger area than uh, uh, parking lots. So uh, we could cover, let's say, ski events, rally, or things where it's very challenging to, to do cabling in the field. Okay, so this is the use case. I was asked to make a simple drawing. I don't know if I succeeded, <laughs> but uh, if you see the, the middle square here, that, uh, that's depicted with the red, uh, red square in the middle, that's the private 5G island. This is standalone, non-public network, so it's like the, the, the coolest sort. We have our own frequency frequencies, uh, and it's, um, it's very, very robust. So this can take even uh, a situation where you're losing the backhaul. So the connection to the internet is lost, but still you're able to produce within that 5G island with all the high quality feeds. And as we always do, there is a backup program being served back to our MCR, Master Control, and on air, basically. We didn't go on air with this trial, but we plan to do so in a month from now. So uh, this is not unusual. Using LiveView as a backup output for program, uh, we're actually bonding normal uh, cellular networks, public networks, and KA band as satellite uplink. So we're quite sure that we get the program home. But what's unusual is that we're able to also control this entire island with everything that's happening inside it, just with a simple low bitrate and low latency connection on normal public networks, wireless. So we can, with a pad basically, uh, control the mixer, which is virtual. It doesn't look like this. It's just a program running inside. And there doesn't have to be anyone here, except from, of course, the photographers. Well, maybe not even the photographers, if you can't control the camera. But in, in ideal circumstances, this would be remotely controlled from anywhere. And uh, just to make things a bit more difficult, <laughs> we also duplicated this setup. So we have an identical setup here in the cloud. And this was uh, provided by uh, VisRT, VisVector Plus, and we were helping, we were helped out by uh, Triple M, Vegar Elgisem and Ivar Exet. They uh, they were really helpful and actually joined us in the event. And uh, we have been trying to, of course, get all the full quality feeds up here and made it make it available to any producers. We just tried using the same sources at NRK and Triple M, so we were able to work in parallel. So looking a bit more into uh, the details, <laughs> I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but it's, it's uh, kind, of, uh, kind of explains our challenges. This was the integration we were trying to make work in the field. We didn't have enough time to make that properly work. So we had to go with something called NDI5 to get the full quality feeds into the cloud and make it available uh, at our MCR and Triple M. Uh, we were uh, well, we didn't experience that as a good thing. So we're going to try to do what we actually came to uh, do, and we're going to do that within the next month, actually within the next two weeks. We're going to try to integrate properly with uh, a protocol called Xlink, uh, and that has a way more control than NDI. You can compare it like 
well, it's Duplo versus Lego, so you get <laughs> a lot more detailed uh, control of the transport. Okay, um, back to the practical part. We have um, portable devices with the high-end cameras and also the low-end NDI cameras and the really high-end cameras with proper CCUs. It all worked fine, uh, except from the thing that Budil told me. Uh, we should have these modems inside of the camera. It would make it way easier. It's always external modems. And we didn't make these modems work properly either. They're connected to the 5G core, uh, uh, Atonet in this case. We were trying to get it to work with Comocore. This is details, maybe not important to you, but it's, it does matter in terms of capacity. So within the next two weeks, we will get more capacity just by replacing some, some of the core parts. Okay, so uh, Video X link. It's the one below uh, on the right side. Uh, that's a product, uh, it could be anything, but I think for us this works fine. It's uh, quite uh, flexible and it has whatever you need for remote production. You can even bring camera control uh, on layer two transparently. So basically you're not doing anything to the content within that part of the network. We're just bringing it forward so it works. <laughs> Uh, and of course, uh, the great thing about Video X Link in comparison to SRT, which is also another way to do UDP retransmission. I mean, if you lose packets, you need to resend them. So the X Link uh, thing actually doesn't wait for the acknowledge. It doesn't wait to know that it's received, because that will lead to deadlocks, which is the problem with SRT. In this case, you're just resending if you realize that it took too long to get the packets in. So Xlink, I think that works for us practically. So we have something that we can actually use in production already. And I know uh, there has been a lot of talk about NDI. I just want to mention that's mainly tailored for local area networks. People tend to think that you can use NDI for everything. Well, it actually works for a lot, but not really for internet. They claim that it will. With NDI 5, it can, of course, work on the internet. Uh, this uh, is called Reliable UDP, RUDP. It's actually uh, just Google's Quick, uh, which is an open source uh, thing. Uh, it's built on that. And it will be implemented, well, Quick will be implemented in HTTP 3, so I think we'll see a lot more of that. But in this product, NDI 5, it's not ready. It was a beta, so it didn't, didn't work properly. NDI Bridge was, was a beta. Okay, uh, but NDI 5 promised another thing that's also interesting to us, or at least the low end production uh, part of us, uh, and uh, that is the support for ARM processors. Uh, ARM processors is what's inside mobile devices, and that can be, uh, well, working way more efficiently if you have native support for them. So NDI 5 is, is promising, and I'd, I'd like to see it work in, in the next round. So we can have mobile mixers basically are like this, working for real. We did try it on the Switcher Studio, not on NDI, but uh, on a lower quality. Uh, it wasn't good quality, but we actually did broadcast it on NRK. Okay, uh, this is the golden standard. This is, if we were to replace all the things we did with fiber, this is the answer. 2110, and now it's added with a dash 22, which means that you can actually compress video. It's not only uncompressed. So you're using, in example, uh, JPEG XS in this case. Uh, it's a compression ratio of 10 to 1, so it's still quite high bit rates. It's in the hundreds uh, megabits, but we're able to do that on 5G, especially if you use the higher frequency bands in 5G. We haven't tested this, but it would be interesting to do that with others. So I invite you to, to join and, and try and see if that actually works. Uh, I know there is equipment made for it, but uh, yeah, it will be challenging. And in particular because of the latency requirements, precision with PTP2 and yeah, all the details I can do with the ones interested. So cloud uh, uh, related, I just want to mention that you can also, uh, in addition to looking at the more efficient workflows, you could also use this as a backup. So let's say your vision mixer uh, went down, you would still, ha still have a duplicate of that vision mixer in the cloud, so you could produce uh, directly in the cloud. Of course, that means you have to have the backhaul running, the connection to internet. But there are many ways to look at this, so I, I find it interesting to investigate further. 
With uh, Telenor, by the way, we have been able to look into how to get slices work, priority on traffic. We did it with 4K for news gathering. That's not useful at all. <laughs> it's just to show that we can. Uh, but I think it's interesting to see uh, that it's possible to get uh, traffic in a certain quality into our MCR master control room. So this could work on air, but it's a bit early. It requires uh, the 5G core to be implemented. And that's only on the research network for now. So not commercially available, but it uh, shows that also the operators are looking into scenarios which are interesting to us. It would actually solve this scenario where you have an overcrowded area, all cell phones trying to use the same resources and uh, yeah, all the uh, capacity is being spent there basically. So if we weren't, if we didn't have any priority, we wouldn't be able to broadcast from, from these events. But it doesn't solve the most important thing and that is the need for coverage. So if for natural reasons, some in disasters or terror, there is no coverage, well, then it doesn't help to get priority on the network that's not there. So for that, we need a cell on wheels, which is the same as the Norwegian defense. And with the use case that we just described, together with the army use case, where they're trying to figure out where the bullets came from, basically, uh, we have uh, gotten the GLOMO awards together with Telenor, which is like the Oscar of mobile operators. So I think this is the way forward. Also, we can cooperate with the Norwegian army, of course, uh, with drones. Uh, we can get pictures from areas uh, where, well, actually before the emergency services arrive. So I think that can have great uh, news value. Okay, so this is the cooperation. Uh, Mainly the key personnel uh, from Norwegian Defense. I think they can speak from, for themselves. Uh, Kashif, who is the R&D guy from Telnor, and he has support from a lot of researchers, research, researchers <laughs> at 5G Vini. And of course, Michelle working on the frequencies. As Encom mentioned, we need uh, separate frequencies to make this work. Um, and uh, yeah, Triple M, who has been really helpful. So this is the credits. I'll try to run through it, as broadcasters always do these days, very quickly. <laughs> uh, Fudge 5D, EU sponsored, uh, and uh, this is the team. It's great if we are able to grow. We just started. We only had this thing for a couple of weeks. Now, let's work together. I think uh, most broadcasters are in this for the same reasons. So we can run the video if there is time. Today we are going to unveil a state-of-the-art private 5G network built by Telenor with the partners in the context of Fudge 5G project, which is an EU-funded project. So we have the power distribution unit, we have the baseband unit which is connected on the antenna on the roof, then the traffic goes to the mobile core which is from Kubo core and that is hosted on an HP DL110. And then the traffic goes to the external world via the Goodmail router. This is an experimental setup which allows us to experiment with multiple 5G cores. For example, in addition to the Kumo core 5G core, we have the Athonet 5G core on a very small box. And then for extreme performance, we have 5G core from Athonet on the Amazon Snowball Edge. What we are going to showcase today is a customized end-to-end -end 5G solution for the Norwegian broadcaster NRK and Norwegian Defense. For NRK, we are offering an uplink dominant network slice, whereas for Norwegian Defense, we are offering a highly secure 5G network. What is common in both these use cases is that we are offering coverage and capacity on demand. This is the beginning of our cooperation with NRK and Norwegian Defense. So stay tuned for more exciting trials in the days to come. Thank you very much. So this is a 5G standalone network, completely autonomous. Um, and the advantage is that it's fully mobile, as you can see. We can guarantee the coverage wherever we want to. It has a mobile mast that can go up to 10 meters and we can rotate the antennas in all directions. We can also guarantee the quality of service, for instance, if we want to transfer a video. Uh, we also have dedicated frequencies, uh, meaning that we don't have to compete with other uh, about, uh, about the spectrum, so we can deploy very fast. It has an edge data center, so we can locally provide services to all the users connected to this network. 
whenever we have backhaul via satellite communication or commercial uh, mobile networks, uh, we can also connect to the outside world. Technically, this is a standalone network, meaning that we have no legacy, no 2G, 3G, 4G, only 5G. That means reduced uh, complexity and higher security. This kind of setup also gives a lot of uh, flexibility. For instance, we can play with a frame structure of the time slot. And in our case, we have more uplink capacity uh, than comparing with uh, commercial networks. And for instance, in use case related to, uh, to video and media, uh, this is very, very useful. So in the current test that we're running, we're running more efficient workflows, running both a local production unit, but also a clouded production unit running simultaneously. That allows our users to access content and the tools that we're using instantaneously in the cloud. And as a backup, we're also able to access all our central production resources locally and maintain production even if the backhaul falls down. To be able to use uh, standalone non-public networks, you have to have access to frequencies. And while before, I would say, uh, broadcasters had access to dedicated spectrum, uh, now the same spectrum is uh, either auctioned or licensed to telecommunication companies. And for a permanent use, uh, while the use case of broadcasters is, is different. Uh, we need the spectrum for a limited period of time to cover an event or for a even shorter for covering a, a, a emergency situation or any kind of like news gathering. And uh, we wouldn't we couldn't say where in the country. Uh, so it, it could be like in a short notice and anywhere in the country. Uh, actually, there are other users with a similar case, like the, the armed forces, and we maybe could find some kind of collaboration with them. Okay. And if I could then welcome everybody who has participated so far, we will have a little Q&A. Uh, Aspen is uh, here with us from Oslo. Um, uh, and uh, feel free, we have 10-15 uh, minutes to uh, still. Uh, if there are any questions in the audience, please, please join in. Uh, but I will start because Aspen, he said to you, <laughs> he came with this invite. Uh, uh, yeah, welcome to the table. We would like to speak with you. And uh, we heard from yeah both you uh, and your colleagues now. Uh, uh, what would you? What, what's on the wish list for speaking with uh, with uh, the, the the authorities here yeah, when it comes to frequencies? Yeah, I think that's quite apparent. I think uh, most importantly, we need both coverage and capacity on demand, but also uh, on short notice and uh, at a geographical place where we don't know where, because that's the nature of the news events. And uh, for, yeah, for the rest of that process, I think it's probably not tailored for, for that kind of applications. Uh, and I'm wondering if, if NCOM has uh, an answer to how we can solve that. Yeah, I can, I can start. Uh, it was very interesting to hear uh, you guys talking about the different scenarios. And I had a lot of notes uh, when you talked. and. Um, and it, it's, it's important for us to understand your needs. And, uh, but I must firstly say that the coverage in Norway is extremely good in the public networks. So, so let's keep that in mind first. Um, almost the full part of Norway is covered by 4G networks today and will be covered by 5G networks going forward. So, so, so that's something that we need to look into because there is a, a nationwide network which will solve a lot of these problems because in the end you also need backbone for, for these transmissions, either satellite or some other solutions. But of course I see that you also have some other uh, use cases and needs. Uh, some of them are in predefined uh, places. Uh, I think those are easier to manage, uh, either with dedicated frequencies or leasing frequencies from the operators if they're not using them themselves in that area. And of course, the the, um, the the problematic cases are those nomadic cases. We really don't know where they are and at what time they're needed, because it's very inefficient to 
allocate uh, important frequencies for those use cases when there is very, very limited usage. So, so I like the last sentence that you had, it's collaboration. We need to find uh, good collaboration with different users that could actually collectively use the frequencies more efficiently together and not set aside spectrum uh, to certain use groups, uh, which are mainly not used at all uh, if you add up the time. So I think the uh, calibration thing is that something we need to look into. Very good. And uh, Bo, uh, you brought up some other aspects that could. Uh, is, do you see any other way to yeah solve this? That f from your perspective. Well, um, there are uh, there are many ways it could be solved. The, the challenge is how to solve it optimally in a good way and also in a way that that um, facilitates innovation. So I think that what's what's challenging now is that we. Um, we really don't know what 5G will be. Uh, we know what it is, but it's not ready yet. Uh, and for, for me, it's more um, it's more of a, uh, a world championship. It's it's more about how, how Norway could could play a role now. How we manage to 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 cooperate uh, within all sectors and with the with the authorities uh, to ensure to find the good ways and the good ways that stimulate innovation in Norway, um, enabling this as a new field of um, of industry for us. Because I think there are lots and lots of opportunities. We are ahead, we have good, well, innovative companies and a low threshold for, uh, for cooperation. So I think that actually the, the important thing is not what the solution is, but how we are going to find it and how we are going to develop it. And that we should probably start now, uh, all of us together. Yeah. So, and as you said, it's, it's award-winning already. <laughs> so, meaning we are ahead? Hmm. Is that your impression now? Well, honestly, I would see that we were a bit more ahead. But I think that's, uh, that's, this is due to the fact that we're kind of late in the game, as uh, Encom told us as well. I mean, uh, we are starting to learn now, uh, but we have partners who have learned for a while. So I think uh, with that, we can make it work. And I quite agree also with Encom that uh, cooperation with Norwegian Defense, for example, makes sense. Uh, they have the same needs as us, but most probably not at the same time, or we could cooperate in some way. And I think also multiple content producers and broadcasters can go together and justify a resource with frequencies. Mm. Very good. Um, uh, Aspen, are, are there other industries that are bringing out these demands uh, that could also go into cooperation? Uh. There is, of course, the, the, the industry themselves, as Board mentioned as well, the kind of the use case that he mentioned is, but that is easier to solve and it's, it's part of the current regulation. So, so finding the different nomadic use cases, uh, on my top of my head, I don't really have any, but, but there is a lot of research going into this, how to utilize Spectrum more efficiently with several users. And, and DARPA in the US uh, has tested out several ways to doing this. That is something that will come uh, 10 years from now, but then it's the systems themselves kind of allocating and then using the resources most efficiently. And then you don't really, don't really matter who is the different users. Uh, it's just users uh, uh, opting for time on air and then just have to have the kind of mechanisms to, to prioritize them within themselves. But that is, um, that is income 10 years from now. Uh, we're not there at the moment. It's more static allocations at the moment. So, so now we need to find them. Uh, but for the moment, I don't really know uh, others than the defense and, and the media production that's kind of advocating the same kind of needs. But that's something that we need to look into because and it doesn't really need to be all of them at once as well. Uh, if if the, the defense and media production starts, then I guess there is room for more to enter into that area going forward. So we not, don't really have to kind of shut the door at, uh, at this day as well. Um, Budel, uh, since you are working close with the editorial teams, are there some crazy ideas that, <laughs> that is lifted that will push the boundaries even more? Uh, well, we don't have anything here in mind just now, but uh, I think there will come. And as uh, we experience this more, I think the crazy idea will pop up. Yeah. So I think they will be there. 
Uh, and also, uh, no one mentioned this here, uh, but of course, we are excited about the pricing models that are coming. Uh, that also will play uh, a role here to, to take that uh, and to start to use this. Absolutely. Yes. Price, pricing models, is that, how, how are they? Are, are it, any signals yet? or? We don't know. We don't know. <laughs> 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 because uh, all the well, it's being auctioned as we speak. Uh, yeah, yeah. All the frequencies to the operators, uh, and uh, it will be market-based, of course. Yeah. Uh, so we will have to rent it from them. But I think, uh, as you mentioned previously, there are there is a potential actually to cooperate also on 2.3 uh, gigahertz. I mean, we do uh, have a cooperation with TV2 there. I think we have uh, 20 megahertz each, but we can of course collaborate in a way that we get 40 megahertz, which was what we did on the trial. It will give us uh, well, 110 megabits upstream. It's not ideal, but it's uh, it's enough, I think, to do many other productions. But I think the challenge there is the availability of equipment. Uh, I, I hear you say that it's in production in Asia, but uh, in Europe, uh, yeah, we find it challenging to find the, the things we need to make it work. But okay, there are there are many many ways to, to look at this, mm. and I think uh, most importantly, we don't need to believe the hype because uh, even though uh, Telenor claims to cover 99% uh, population-wise, the country uh, within uh, 2024, it's not going to be the kind of capacity we need for these event uh, productions, for sure. So that's ma mainly for news, but for bigger events, uh, we definitely need our own frequencies. Uh, so Aspen, you wanted to... Uh, yeah, just a comment, and, and, and I think one of the pictures that you showed, um, uh, Eric, is, is, is kind of the key issue here. You said that there is equipment that is kind of the issue. And, and if you look at the Holm and Colon, which I guess was your picture, and then you have the, the problem because these frequencies are initially kind of made for mobile operators. And there is thousands of thousands of thousands of people there wanting to use 5G at Holm and Colon at the same time as you are going to use or you need to use them. And I guess that's kind of the key here. We need to find kind of spaces for both of these users. And uh, maybe not 3.6 gigahertz is the ideal band for media production because in a lot of these areas, there's a lot of users needing to use these frequencies as well. And we need to find sharing mechanisms and, and that might be using different frequency bands. And, and going forward, I'm, I'm quite sure that 5G and equipment will be available in other bands as well. So we need to just find the right frequency bands. Uh, just a quick follow-up there uh, as well, uh, Aspen, uh, since you mentioned, are, are there any mechanisms uh, in the, yeah, the regulations, the what's being auctioned now, that you can push in when it comes to pricing, to fair pricing and that kind of thing? Or is it just competition between the... Uh, so the, so it, it, it's competition, of course, but we did another uh, thing as well. We, we, we set aside another frequency band, 3.8 to 4, the 2 gigahertz band for private networks as well and, and local uh, area networks where we have really, really cheap prices. Um, so in that sense, if you don't find a solution in the 3.6 gigahertz band, then you can buy uh, access to the 3.8 to 3, 4 to 2 gigahertz band, which is really, really cheap. And you can use that as a bargain point with the operators uh, to say, if you don't provide me with good prices, okay, then I'll find a solution elsewhere. Yeah. You see. Uh, are there any questions in the audience here before we... Is there anyone who would like to ask this very competent uh, panel from... Uh, anyone? No. Um, I, one final from me then, before we round off. You mentioned IoT as, uh, yeah, as one of the protocols. Uh, or um, How is that transferable for news production or journalism? Well, would you like I, to ask? Yeah. Yeah. No, you can ask. Yeah. 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 Uh, the IoT part is more about getting lots of information yeah. uh, from many places. Um, it's it's a difficult question to say what part that would play in media. Um, so I would probably probably say that it's it's more or less it's more of detecting what's going on in an area. Um, it would probably uh, hopefully. Uh, detect the disasters before they happen, so that you won't have to come there. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but I don't think it will have, from my perspective, it won't be that relevant with media production. But I might be wrong, and hopefully I'm wrong. No, I, you just see that uh, uh, 
the bathing temperatures and that kind of collection of data as you mentioned from a vast majority yeah, or from a yeah, it could be yeah, yeah. sensing information yeah. is yeah. is always of relevance in in UAS so uh, it's about data liberation, making data available and uh, making the best out of it. Yeah, but what, what about uh, how is the cost of collecting in a huge data in, during sensors like this? As the investment into these sensors, how do you see that? Is the cost will be uh, rapidly decreasing. Uh, so in, in the future, it will be almost, uh, probably uh, almost close to none uh, in collecting one piece of information. And then it scales, so if you need several sensors, that would obviously need m cost more. But, but most probably, getting information is, is not going to be very expensive in the future, and the network coverage is everywhere. Yeah. I think that it will be a future uh, discussion or a future session around that. Uh, for now, production is the main thing, uh, how to get content in. It's, we have not spoken much about how to yeah, use 5G for streaming because that is back to, yeah, that, that is very transferable to the 4G. So it's very much about how can we improve our gathering of content and how we can. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank all of you for joining us here today. Uh, has been uh, very interesting, I feel, and uh, hopefully we can uh, have good talks uh, in the coming uh, months as well. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, Aspen, for joining us. And uh, hopefully we have established a link in here now for future debates. Sure have. Okay, thank you.